Welcome back to my channel everybody. Today I'm going to discuss a topic that I'm very passionate about. If you like learning about metaphysics and topics about spirituality, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to become part of this community. In this video, I'm going to discuss my favorite tarot deck, the Thoth tarot deck, along with some background information as to why I've been drawn to it. This wasn't my first tarot deck. I first started with the Rider Waite tarot deck which I believe is a very good starting point for anybody just beginning with tarot. If you happen to have a subscription to the Gaia Network, which is basically like a spiritual Netflix, I highly recommend checking out season four of Teresa Bullard's Mystery Teachings, in which she discusses all of the major arcana of the Rider Waite deck. Before I dive in to the information about this wonderful deck, I'd like to provide a wider context and a story of the trail of sparks of synchronicity that led me to this widely esteemed divinatory tool. This story begins with a trio that correspond to the same archetype, but are known by different names in different cultures. These are the Roman god Mercury, the Greek god Hermes, and the Egyptian deity Thoth. There are many more figures that correspond to this archetype, but in this video I'm going to stick to these three. The first is the god Mercury as known to the Roman pagans. He is the god of commerce, travel, and communication. The celestial body Mercury is all about analysis and categorizing things in nature, and fittingly is also the planet of communication. I find this interesting to note because language, which breaks things down into smaller categories for the greater purpose of understanding, is what this archetype is all about. The Mercury archetype has been described as the intellectual ordering of the phenomenal nature of existence. Being related to communication, when Mercury retrogrades or appears to move backwards in the sky, people tend to report problems with technology as well as the tendency towards situations where miscommunications occur. As you can see here, the symbol or what is known as the glyph for the planet and element Mercury looks almost like a little man with wings on his head, which resemble how the Greek god of communication Hermes was portrayed with a helmet adorned with wings. Each part of the glyph can be broken down into the respective meanings. For example, like in all astrological and and alchemical symbols, the circle, which is the head, represents the sun or primal unity. The symbol for the moon is a semicircle, which can be seen in the mercury glyph as the wings on the head. And the cross, which is the body of the mercury glyph, represents the soul. The circle with a cross within it is an alchemical symbol that represents earth. So this glyph in total also represents the connection between spirit and matter. When describing someone as a mercurial temperament, you're describing them as someone with frequent mood changes and unpredictable behavior which I believe is an apt word choice because looking at Mercury, which is the fastest moving planet around the sun, changes signs approximately every 14 days or so when it's not in retrograde. My personal connection with the mercurial archetype is very strong and Mercury is the ruling planet of my astrological natal chart. In a natal chart, Mercury rules over the signs of Virgo and Gemini. And Gemini is my sun sign and Virgo is my rising sign. The second in this archetypal trio was encapsulated by the Greeks as Hermes Trismegistus, or thrice greatest. No one knows for sure why he was called that, but some believe it to be because he knew the three great wisdoms of the universe. Alchemy, the operation of the sun, astrology, the operation of the stars, and theurgy, the operation of the gods. In Greek mythology, Hermes acted as the messenger between the gods and the humans. This makes sense in relation to the Mercury glyph that can be interpreted as Hermes with his winged helmet, uniting spirit and matter through the lens of intellect. And this is also relating to the Egyptian god Thoth, who was said to be the bringer of people to the underworld. Hermes Trismegistus was the alleged author of the Hermetic Corpus, which are the texts that form the basis for the philosophy of Hermeticism. Hermeticism is a non-Christian branch of Gnosticism that's said to date back to the first and second centuries AD. It's a philosophy relating to principles encompassed in the study of astrology, alchemy, and theosophy. The point of this was to reach a state of gnosis, meaning a state of empirical scientific knowledge about spiritual mysteries. There are seven main principles relating to the philosophy of Hermeticism and they're as follows. The first is the principle of mentalism, which states that the entire universe is one living mind and our thoughts affect not only the physical planes of existence, but the energetic planes as well. The second principle is the principle of correspondence, which is summed up nicely by the phrase as above, so below. This means that there's a correspondence between the laws that govern each plane of existence to all others. From looking at the tiny spiral structure of our DNA to a snail shell spiral to the spiral of an entire galaxy, you can see that the laws of the universe all are similar 
across all the different planes. This idea relates to the concept of the universe as a fractalized hologram, in which each tiny part contains the whole. The third hermetic principle is the principle of vibration, which states that everything in this entire universe is all vibrating, differing only in frequencies. Everything from our brain waves to the different emotions that we feel correspond to different vibratory frequencies. For example, emotions are just vibrating at different rates. It's said that the lower, more negative emotions vibrate more slowly at a lower frequency, and the higher, more positive emotions like love or gratitude vibrate at a higher frequency. Number four is the principle of polarity, which states that everything in the universe has poles or opposites. This plane of existence that we live on, everything is polarized. In order to have hot, we must have cold. In order to have light, there must be darkness. The fifth is a principle of rhythm, which describes everything as flowing in and out like the tides of an ocean. All things are part of a cycle. Whether it's the tiny 28-day cycle of the moon or the larger 25,000-year cycle, which I described in my previous videos, everything is part of a cycle. Smaller cycles within larger cycles within even larger cycles. The sixth principle is the principle of cause and effect, which states that every cause has an effect and every effect a cause. This means that nothing happens by chance. All things are connected. When I think of this principle, I think of the experiment that was done where an atom was replicated into another atom and they were separated approximately 14 miles apart. One atom was manipulated and the other showed signs of being manipulated in the exact same way, even though it wasn't being touched. This shows that even though these atoms were so far apart, they were still connected. In physics, this is known as the phenomena of entanglement. The seventh and the last principle is the principle of gender, which states that everything in this universe has its masculine and feminine principles. Thinking about the dichotomies such as yin or yang, or Shiva or Shakti, or the sun or moon encapsulates this quite nicely. Masculine energy is penetrative, active, and assertive, whereas feminine energy is receptive and nourishing. The study of Hermeticism is a whole other topic which I plan to cover in more detail at some point. What I like about this philosophy is that it's a point of view where all other views are respected and one arrives at their standpoints through rational empiricism. Hermes is also known to be associated with the symbol of the caduceus, which as you can see here, looks like a rod with two snakes wrapping around the pole. This is honestly one of my favorite symbols because of all the things that it represents. I really like this painting I did a while back that illustrates the meaning of this symbol. This symbol in one sense represents our spiritual and energetic anatomy. The two snakes and the center pole represent the three major energetic pathways that flow up and down our spinal column. I talk more about these specific energy pathways called the Ida, Pingala, and Shushma Nanadis in my last video, which you can go check out to learn more. The points where the snakes intersect the pole symbolize our chakras the most major energetic points on our body. The pine cone on the top of the caduceus is representative of the pineal, meaning cone-shaped gland, which is our third eye center, also known as the Ajna Chakra. In my painting, I incorporated the Eye of Horus, who is another Egyptian god, connected in many ways to the Thoth tarot. The symbol known as the Eye of Horus looks strikingly similar to the shape that's seen when one looks at a sagittal or sideways slice of the brain. How cool is that? It definitely suggests that ancient cultures like that of ancient Egypt knew the significance of this shape and its relation to the brain and specifically the pineal gland. Interestingly, the same archetype as depicted by Mercury and Hermes is also portrayed by the Egyptian god Thoth, who is the inventor of writing, interpreter to the gods, and creator of language. He's portrayed as a human with the head of an ibis bird. Thoth was said to be the author of the Emerald Tablets, which is a concise and widely influential hermetic text. An excellent resource that talks about this intricate piece of work is the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets by Billy Carson. Also, check out his podcast and streaming service, Forbidden Knowledge, which are absolutely mind-blowing. As you can see, the archetype of Thoth, Hermes, and Mercury are all profoundly similar. They're all an example of syncretism, which are a blending of different mythologies and religions. With my connection to Egyptian mythology, astrology, and in particular, the archetype of Mercury, I've grown to become a really big fan of the Thoth Tarot. I look back to the day when I first purchased this deck. I was in a metaphysical shop 
and was immediately drawn to it when I saw the familiar name Thoth. I was hooked when I opened up the box and took a look at the surreal images on the cards. Little did I know that this would be a rabbit hole of discovery that I've only still just begun. Even though there's much controversy surrounding its co-creator, Aleister Crowley, I don't believe it's necessary to like the artist in order to appreciate their work. So with that background out of the way, I'd like to provide a little bit of basic information about this deck for those of you who want to see if this particular deck is right for you. Obviously not all of the information about this complex deck can be fit into one video, but I plan on making more videos about this topic in the future. This deck was conceived between 1938 and 1943 by Aleister Crowley and illustrated by Lady Frida Harris, who both died before the publication of the deck in 1969 by Ordo Temple Orientis. These are some resources that I found particularly helpful when I was researching this deck. Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Tarot by Lon Milo Duquette. Tarot, Mirror of the Soul, Handbook for the Aleister Crowley Tarot by Gerd Ziegler. And lastly, and perhaps most difficult to read, The Book of Thoth, Egyptian Tarot by Aleister Crowley himself. There are certain important differences between traditional tarot and the Thoth tarot. For example, the court cards in the Rider Waite deck are page, knight, queen, and king. Whereas in the Thoth deck, the court cards are princess, prince, queen, and knight. There are also certain differences in the major arcana in both decks. For example, the card known as Strength in the Rider Waite deck is called Lust in the Thoth deck. The Judgment card in the Rider Waite deck is called the Eon card in the Thoth deck. There are four suits in tarot, just like traditional playing cards, that correspond to a particular element. The Pentacles, as known in the Rider Waite tarot deck, are known as Discs in the Thoth tarot deck, and these correspond to the element of Earth. Swords in both decks correspond to the element of air, and cups in both decks correspond to the element of water. Lastly, wands, also in both decks, correspond to the element of fire. One of the most important correspondences to this deck and essentially all tarot is in relation to Kabbalah. Kabbalah is an esoteric school of thought in Jewish mysticism. In the Kabbalah is a well-known symbol, the Tree of Life, in which all tarot cards are based upon. The Tree of Life shows the ten sephirot, or emanations from the divine, and how the divine infinite light takes different pathways and condenses and manifests into the physical. It's said that the Tree of Life is a tree that grows upside down, with its roots found in heaven, and moving downwards to the tenth emanation, which is the fruit of the tree, or the physical earth. The pathways between each of these spheres represent each of the 22 trump cards or the cards of the major arcana. Each sphere of the tree or sephiro represent the minor arcana of the tarot, meaning the aces to the tens, which are the suit cards. The ones or aces are at the very top of the tree in the heavens. They represent pure undivided spirit and are described as the root of each element. The twos encompass the entire zodiac and are described as the elements in their purest form. The threes represent creation in relation to each of the elements and are like a womb that is about to give birth. The fours represent stability and are the stable aspects of each of the suits. Fives are all about tests and represent change after the stability of the fours. The beautiful sixes are the idealized form of each suit. The sevens represent emotions and desires and are all about overcoming obstacles to achieve one's goals. The eights represent the intellectual, mental attributes of each of the suits. And of course, these cards are in relation to Mercury. Nearing the bottom of the tree, you see the nines, which represent the collective unconscious. The nines take each suit to its extremes, either in a good or bad way. The tens are the fruit of the tree. They represent completion and new beginnings. They alternate between positive and negative meanings which speaks for the ups and downs of life here on earth. The tree of life originating in the Jewish Kabbalah and as seen through the tradition of Western Hermeticism is so complex and intricate. It's amazing how there are correspondences with numerology, with each of the numbers being like its own personality with different characteristics. Just like how the eights are associated with Mercury and are the mental aspects of each of the suits. Certain cards are also said to rule certain portions or degrees of each of the zodiac constellations and each of the cards in particular is in relation to a specific zodiac sign. 
For instance, the Lover's card is associated with Gemini and the Chariot card is associated with Cancer. I love the artwork on the back of the cards, which shows a cross. Each of the tiny details on the back of the card has very significant meaning. The tiny cross divided into six in the center of the card is adorned with a five petaled rose on the top. This is symbolic of how the number five represents the microcosm, the small limited world that us human can perceive with our five senses. The number six represents the macrocosm, the greater universe beyond what we can perceive as humans. This illustrates that we are part of a much bigger world and are connected to God and the entire universe. The three petals coming out of the rose represent the three main elements according to Jewish mysticism, and they're the three primary colors. On the top, we have the fool in yellow representing air, the hangman as a blue petal representing water, and the aeon or judgment in other tarot decks as a red petal representing the fire element. The next circle going outward represents the seven ancient planets, and the outermost circle represents the 12 constellations. As you can see, the topic of tarot, and specifically Thoth tarot, is extremely complex and nuanced. I've barely scratched the surface of this topic over the past three years I've been working with this deck, but I plan to do more research and share my findings. Before I started preparing and doing research for this video, I decided to do a mini reading using the Thoth deck. In one sense, it was to see if this video was a good fit for this time, and in another, to see what topics I should focus on during its creation. So these are the cards that I got. The Four of Swords, which is all about inner clarity and spiritual creativity, Jupiter in Libra. The Princess of Wands, which is about passion, vitality, and overcoming self-limiting fears. And the Eight of Wands, which is about clear, direct communication, which is Mercury in Sagittarius. So those are the cards that I got, which I find to be perfectly fitting. They gave me the feeling that this was definitely the right time to do this video. Even though I have several different topics of which I could have spoken about, this is the topic that sparked the most joy. This reading encouraged me to overcome any doubts I had surrounding the creation of this video, and also to have confidence in my inner clarity and ability to communicate this complex topic. I hope you enjoyed this short introduction to my favorite tarot deck. Please let me know in the comment section below if there's anything else that you would like me to talk about in regards to this deck. As always, sending lots of love your way. Bye now.